Hey everybody, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 12. We're going to read the chapter together and then we're going to get right into our sermon. So join with me, Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who had belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of the unleavened bread, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow and he did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought that he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which was opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They kept or they said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison, and he said, report these things to James and the brethren. Then he left and went to another place. Now, when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him, he had not found him. He examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and was spending time there. Now he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and with one accord they came to him. And having won over Balstus, the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who is also called Mark. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. We have a great story today. It covers a lot of ground, and it starts with the revelation that James, the brother of John, had been put to death by Herod. Now, this is one half of the Sons of Thunder. He was an apostle, and he was a great man. But the church was still being persecuted, and he was put to death. Now, in a similar circumstance, Herod saw that it pleased the Jewish people to put the apostles to death because they were still adamant against Christianity. And so they got Peter, and they put him in jail. Now, it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread around the time of Passover, and Peter was locked up waiting for Passover to pass so he could be brought before the people. And the night that he was supposed to be brought before the people, the church was praying. Now, this is an important and uh, encouraging side note. 
because this is not the only time it says it in this chapter. It says the church was praying when he was delivered and when Peter goes to uh, John Mark's house, they were praying for him at that same time. They were praying and God was busy doing his answer to their prayers. Now, I want to give you some complexity to this story. First of all, I want you to notice the fact that they were praying for Peter, expecting that he would uh, be freed. But when Rhoda, the servant girl, told them that Peter was at the gate, they said it was his angel. They thought he was dead. They were praying for his freedom, but they expected him to die. Now, they had already learned to think this way because James, the brother of John, had died. And I promise you, brothers and sisters, they prayed for his freedom as well. So what can we take away from this? Just as a brief aside, brothers and sisters, sometimes our prayers don't get answered the way we want to. And sometimes we might even pray half believing that it's going to work. But brothers and sisters, our power in our prayer is not from the eloquence that we bring to God. It is in our belief that he hears us and that he responds to us and answers our prayers. We don't have to know how or how often he's going to do it. But brothers and sisters, let us never, ever, ever lose faith that God hears us and he acts when we pray. He has his own plans. He has his own ways. But we are told expressly to continue to pray, to continue to seek, to continue to knock. We are reminded in the illustration of Jesus that the persistent widow got the king to do what she wanted because of her persistence. And so I want you to understand that even if you experience a lack of an answer to a prayer in a certain circumstance, like let's say you're praying that James was going to be healed from cancer and then God allowed him to die anyways. Well, when Peter gets cancer, he wants you to continue to pray. You never know if he's going to answer that prayer. And I want you to know he does answer prayers. So Peter is sitting in the jail, bound up, guards all around, and the angel comes and speaks to him. Peter, wake up, get up, put on your clothes, get ready, we're leaving. And so he gets up, he gets dressed, and he leaves. He passes the guards. And in this moment, he doesn't really understand whether or not he's having another vision like he did with Cornelius with the sheet coming out of heaven or if this is really happening. He's not sure. He's just being obedient and following the angel. As they pass through, past the guards, the exterior gate opens by itself, and the angel leads him down a road. Once he gets down that road, the angel just disappears, and Peter comes to his senses and says, oh my goodness, God has delivered me. So the first thing he does is goes to John Mark's house, and he knocks on the door. Rhoda, a sweet little servant girl that she was, I don't know how old she was, but she was a servant girl, and she was excited to see Peter. She opened, she opened the door. Hey, Peter. Or she opened the little slat. Hey, it's Peter. She s shut the slat, ran back inside. Instead of opening the door and letting him in. Now, this is an escaped convict standing out in the street, and he's looking at this person saying, like, what are you doing? So he go, she goes in, argues with the people. They say, no, it's his angel. And finally, because Peter kept knocking, not because the girl convinced them, not because they were curious, but because Peter kept knocking, they finally came to the door. They saw Peter and they rejoiced. And Peter hushed them down very quickly because they don't want the whole neighborhood to know he's there. And he recounted to them how God had answered their prayer and delivered him out of the hands of Herod. And then Peter goes off to someplace else to basically hide. Um, he's going to preach, he's going to do different things, but it's not good for him to be right there, right then. And so he leaves. And the story picks up the next day with the guards awakening and finding Peter gone. Herod questions them. They have no good answers about where Peter went because the Lord struck them. And sure enough, Herod sends them to death. And then the story makes an odd change. It says that Herod left and he went to Caesarea. And actually, there was this another uh, another event going on where uh, the Sidonians uh, uh, had made him mad. And, um, and so what happened is, is they start trying to make peace. They get in good with the 
assistant of Herod and they get a presence with him and they want to make peace with him because Herod is the source of all their food. And so when Peter, when, when Herod puts on his clothes and he gets on um, his uh, veranda or whatever he was overlooking the people, he starts speaking to them, giving a speech. And the people cried out over him, the voice of a God and not a man. They were, they were brown nosing big time. And what ended up happening is Herod relished in that. And rather than give glory to God, he took the glory to himself. And the Bible says that God struck him. And that he died and that he was eaten by worms, probably from the inside out. I know it's disgusting. But God took care of the person who was afflicting his chosen people. And it's interesting that he didn't take him out when he killed James. He didn't take him out when he imprisoned Peter. He took him out when he stole God's glory. Brothers and sisters, we can't steal God's glory. No, you need to give him props when he deserves props. If you don't, he's going to get the glory. He's not going to let someone else share in it. And so, brothers and sisters, Herod died. And then we see this great uh, recurring theme that we see in the book of Acts as we're transferring from one section to another. It says that the church continued to grow and thrive. Now, do you remember where he was at? He was in Caesarea which is where Peter and everybody else was preaching previously. So the church is growing and everybody's thriving, even in the midst of persecution. God kills the oppressors. He takes them out and he delivers his people. And then we're told right at the end that Barnabas and Paul, when they were done in Jerusalem, they had just been sent there, right? To take an offering um, to them. When they left Jerusalem, they're about to go on their first missionary journey and they take with them John Mark. This is what's going on in the text. And what I want to do is encourage you about a couple of things before we get out of here today. There's three main points, but before we get into those points, I want you to notice just real quick um, that the church of God needs to pray fervently for people to be delivered, for and really for anything that they desire to happen from God's help. I can tell you from experience that God answers the prayers of our church, especially even in Pioneer Baptist Church. God has answered our prayers. He's healed people. He's brought families together. He's brought people through financial struggles. He's been gracious to save people out of lostness. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you right now that you need to keep praying. It doesn't matter if he doesn't answer the prayer the way you want. It, he is still the source to go to for anything that you need. He will never stop being the source for what you need. And the moment you go to somebody else other than him, you're going to find out that they're false gods. You're going to be tempted because God allows other powers to work here on earth. But you're going to find out the issue is not whether or not you can get what you want. The issue is whether you will submit to what God wants because he's God. This is the big deal. It's a big deal that Herod found out. God wasn't concerned about preserving James's life. He wasn't concerned about preserving Peter's life, as far as we know. But he interceded in a big way to take out the persecutor, Herod, when he stole God's glory. That's what we know. And so what we know is that we need to go to God in prayer and we need to be consistent in it. We need to know that he is the source of all good things and we need to continue to battle with him and bring our concerns up to him so that our friends and our families can be supported and hopefully delivered out of what could be, what could seem like certain execution of a certain event. Now, let's get into our points. Number one, God delivers. God delivers and he does not abandon his people. God is always delivering his people. From the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were dead to rights in their sin and God should have taken them out, the consequences of sin is death, he told Adam. And when they sinned, instead of killing him immediately, he killed an animal and forestalled his wrath. And he rescued Adam by promising him that he would make a sacrifice for his sins. God delivered Adam. God delivered Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians. God delivered Israel out of the hands of the Philistines and the and all the different um, people groups, the Ammonites and the Midianites, uh, all around the promised land as they oppressed them year after year after year. 
God delivers his people out of uh, all kinds of scenarios in all points in history. And what I want to encourage you today and what I want you to remember is that God delivers his people. Are you stuck today? Are you in a situation where you feel like you need to be delivered? You need help? You need to be rescued? Well, I've got good news for you. God rescues people. Now, here's what we need to hope. Number one, we need to hope that you are going to God and asking him for deliverance. And then secondly, we need to hope that the rest of the church is interceding with you as well. Because we know that from this story that God delivers his people and he often does it through the prayer of his saints. So I don't know where you're at today, but I want to give you an immense amount of hope. God hears our prayers and he delivers his people. He in this situation, woke Peter up from his sleep and put the guards to sleep. He dressed Peter up and he walked him out in safety. He didn't give him any additional information. He just rescued him and he set him on a path to continue to preach the gospel. God delivers his people and he will deliver you. He can deliver you from whatever it is that you're stuck in right now. Go to him even now as I speak. Press pause on the video and ask him to deliver you. Recruit other people, other church members, other believers to intercede on your behalf to deliver you. And I want to encourage you, don't stop until he does. Don't stop until he does. God still delivers his people. He does not abandon them. James died. God didn't abandon him. Jesus died. God didn't abandon him. Just because people die doesn't mean that God abandons you. God delivers. He doesn't abandon. He knows right where you are, and he's got a purpose for it. And that brings us to our second and important point for today. God's deliverance is momentary, and our action is required. God's deliverance is momentary, and our action is required. This is not a new concept to us. Every one of God's miracles ended up with the person eventually dying, right? Eventually, things went back into creation. The water that he turned into wine turned into urine and feces and was delivered back into the dirt the, to be water again. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you today, uh, the people that he healed, the people that he raised from the dead, they ended up dying again of something else. God's actions and his miracles and his deliverance are not permanent. So when Peter was delivered from prison, it didn't mean that he was never going to suffer again. It didn't mean that he was never going to be in trouble again. God interceded, but Peter had to act. And I want you to notice this really quickly because Peter, as soon as the angel left him, had to get to work. He had to get out of Dodge because he was still in danger. Herod wasn't dead yet. He was still in danger. Peter had to go. And he went, as far as we know, without any direction. And so what we need to know is that when God yanks you, when he puts his tow rope on you and yanks you out of the ditch of wherever you're stuck, when he delivers you from whatever oppression you're in, your work will begin immediately. You need to do the things that you know are right, the wise things. And if you don't know what those things are, seek it out from a wise counselor, from a pastor, from a friend from other church members. Find out what you need to do next so that you can get to it. It is your responsibility. Now we know that God's deliverance isn't forever also. So maybe you got snatched out of drug addiction or a bad relationship or some other kind of um, thing like financial straits, you got snatched out of it. Here's what I know and here's what I'm gonna tell you. That one-time deliverance does not stick with you till the day you die. Peter himself was going to be crucified one day. He was crucified upside down, according to church history, because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified like his Lord. Peter was imprisoned again. Peter went to death. I want you to understand something. God has a plan for each of us. Death is going to come for each of us if he doesn't return and call us back home beforehand. So whatever he's freeing you from, you have a responsibility as soon as he's freed you to put your feet on the ground and start doing what it is that you were supposed to be doing in the first place. And it doesn't mean that you're doing something bad in the first place. You just need to get back to doing it. Peter went back to preaching and we ought to get back to doing whatever it is that God has called us to do. And that's our responsibility. And we also not need be discouraged if we slip up and we fall back into the same trap that we were delivered from initially. 
This does not mean that God failed. It just means that we need to be delivered again. And I got some more good news for you. God is patient, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. But the way that you avoid sliding back into that same thing again, that drug addiction again, or that alcoholism again, or that bad relationship again, is by doing what you're supposed to do. And for a lot of you, that might mean going to counseling to learn to stop making bad decisions. For some of you, it might be moving and putting yourself out of the circumstance you're currently in. But I can tell you this, the jump start you need is available to you because God still delivers his people. And we need to pray for God's deliverance. And then that person, whoever needs to be delivered, needs to realize that they need to get to work because God's miracles don't last forever. They are momentary. And then our responsibility kicks back in to do what we're supposed to do. And finally, as we close up today, I want to tell you that God destroys our oppressors. He obliterates our, our, our oppressors. Now, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but Herod was eaten by worms. And one of the descriptions of hell that's given, it says that uh, where the worm doesn't die, is how it phrases it. So you're in the lake of fire where the, where the fire never goes out and the worm doesn't die. We're going to be eaten by worms in hell for eternity if you're going there. And Herod got to taste that while he was on the earth before he passed. Herod, Herod oppressed the Christians and he took glory from God and God destroyed him. And there's three ways that God destroys the oppressors the way that he delivers us from the oppressors. Here's one way. He delivers them here and now by a miracle. He, or he destroys them, rather, here and now by a miracle. In this case, God just afflicted them and watched them wither in front of all the people who thought he was a god. God said, he ain't no god. Watch this. And he just withered in front of them. Herod was taken out immediately. And sometimes God's justice is like that. God intercedes and he destroys somebody immediately. He might use other people, but the justice is imminent. It's immediate. Sometimes God is going to wait for death to take them. Now this is much, it seems more passive, but it's promised. Every person dies. Every oppressor, every dictator will die. They cannot fight their way out of this. And when they die, their body will shut down, whether it's by a bullet or whether it's by starvation or whether it's through syphilis or whether it's through cancer or whether whatever their affliction, old age, they are going to suffer and they're going to die like everybody else. There is no oppressor that's going to avoid the penalty of their sins, which is death. And the third and the most terrifying is that God has promised that he is going to punish the oppressor with eternal damnation. Remember we talked about the fire that's not quenched and the worm that dieth not? Utter torment. If we're to believe the illustration that Jesus gave, the parable of the rich man Lazarus, the rich man was in torment day and night constantly with no relief, begging for even just a drop of water as a mercy from Abraham. That drop of water is denied in that parable. And the mercy and grace and the relief that a person's going to receive in hell is non-existent. Punishment and wrath is what you deserve and what you get when you end up in hell. And if you're an oppressor, if you're a dictator, if you're a person who is um, you know, abusing God's people, you can be certain of this, that God sees it and God will punish it. He may not do it immediately like he did to Herod. He may wait and make them taste death. And even you might think that that death that they experience is sweet. Maybe they went quietly in their sleep and you think they deserve far worse. I can tell you they will not avoid getting what is justly due to them they will see God's punishment and they will suffer eternally in hell. And I want you to know this, that God delivers his people and his church needs to be praying for that deliverance. 
You need to know that once you're delivered, the ball is in your court to do what God has commanded you to do. He's given you grace. He's given you direction. He's given you power. Now it's your job to go put those to work and do what he's called you to do. And if you slip back into uh, problems again, then you pray for deliverance again and you do not shirk your responsibility to pull yourself out and do something different. It's not that you have the ability to overcome it by yourself. It's that once you are pulled out, you are able to overcome through what God has empowered you and directed you to do already. And then finally, I want you to realize that justice will be done, that your oppressors will be held accountable. And if there is somebody who's out there trying intentionally to oppress you, trying intentionally to put you down, God sees it, they will not escape. They will not escape. Even if they call out to Jesus Christ and God saves them because he's a merciful God and he does that kind of thing, the wrath of God due to the injustice that was done to you will fall on Jesus Christ. Just like your sins were absolved through Jesus's suffering, so too can theirs. So if there is an oppressor out there now listening to the sound of my voice, know that you too can be forgiven by the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ. But if you don't, then God has the eternity in hell waiting for you. And that is a promise and a comfort to those of us who have been afflicted. But it's also a terror, terrifying thought for those of you who have not yet figured out how to be forgiven of your sins and be brought to peace with God. Now, brothers and sisters, this interesting story of Peter and uh, his deliverance from jail is just the start of the missionary journeys that we're about to go on with Paul and John, Mark, and Barnabas. After Herod dies, John, Mark, Barnabas, and Paul are moving on to their next place of ministry, and they have adventures of their own. As we see the church grow and as we see it move out, we're going to find out that God's people have to be about the work of the gospel. And when they do, when they go about that work, God acts on their behalf. We're going to see people shipwrecked that are saved, people bit by snakes that are saved. We're going to see people who are lost in darkness and cultures that are totally financially run by idolatry, totally upended and be saved by Jesus's great work. There are great stories to come in the book of Acts. In fact, just to be an encouragement to you, there are great stories for Pioneer Baptist Church in the days to come. We just have to be willing to get out there and do whatever it is that God has called us to do. Let's get snatched out of the ditch. Let's pray for deliverance so that we can get to work and see God move in our lives like he did in the lives of the people in the book of Acts. If you're here today and you're stuck, I'm going to be praying for you here in the end. But I need you and everybody else to know that the only way that you can find God's deliverance to get out of the situation you're in, is to pray to him, recognize that he is God, and receive his mercy. The only way that you're going to be delivered from your biggest problem, the only way you're going to be delivered from your biggest problem, is by accepting Jesus Christ's death on your behalf for your sins. Because as stuck as you feel in financial debt, as stuck as you feel with your health uh, circumstances, as stuck as you feel in prison, it pales in comparison to how stuck you really are in your sins. Because brothers and sisters, we are all like sheep and we've gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own ways. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there is nothing we can do to stop in and of ourselves. But that is why Jesus died to deliver us, to snatch us out. And all we have to do is accept that gift and we can be transferred from the miry clay to the solid rock of Jesus Christ. We can figure out how to walk in a manner worthy of the calling on which we've been called. We can do that because Jesus Christ has delivered us from our sins. And if you're here today and you haven't done that, I'm praying that God would deliver you from your sins today. Let's pray together. God, deliver those people who are stuck in immediate circumstances. If they have oppressors, judge them in Jesus' name. If they have a need of tutors to learn the right path, if they have needs of friends and family to help them, I pray that you'd restore those relationships and make them useful. God, if there are people here listening to the sound of my voice and they don't know how to have peace with you, give them the Holy Spirit. Help them to trust 
and the forgiveness of sins that come through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I pray, oh God, right now they would put their faith in you and they would follow you and that you'd snatch them out, that you would deliver them from their sin. God, we ask that you bless our church in the days to come. Heal the sick, uh, bless their minds. Let them be filled with fruit of the Spirit. I ask, God, that you'd allow them to be encouragers in their communities, that you'd use them to share the gospel, and that you'd let them see their families and their friends come to know you, to have peace in their lives. God, bless them, keep them from the COVID virus, and bless them with courage as we venture out to re-acclimate to society after having been shut in for so long. God, we need your help. We ask that you deliver us from fear, deliver us from the bondage of doubt, and we ask, oh God, that you'd hear us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. I hope that you have a wonderful week and I can't wait to see you soon.